So I have a confession to make. I hate football. I hate football. Not watching it. No, I love watching it. But playing it, I hate it. Now, I know you might be thinking, but Pastor Matt, you have the body for it. You're so muscular. You missed your calling. I know. I know. But I hate playing football. I played football for one year of my life, freshman year of high school. And if you think I'm a little scrawny now, like picture me at 13 years old. I was a twig. I would turn sideways and you'd lose me. Like, where, where, where'd he go, right? But freshman football was the worst. First of all, I didn't have a summer. While everyone else got to go to the beach, I was at the high school early in the morning, lifting weights with these giant linemen who were you know, older than me and bench pressing like five of me. And the coaches would get down in your face and scream at you while you lifted. Come on, you little turd, lift those weights. And that's like the PG version, right? But their vo- veins are like popping out of their neck and I, I hated every moment of it. I'm just not built for that kind of pressure, that kind of you know, environment. But I stuck with it for one whole year. And that might have been the worst year of my life. And one of the worst parts of freshman football of that year was the hazing that was done by the older kids. And, you know, if I'm being honest, sometimes it was a little encouraged by the coaches, or at least they didn't discourage it. They, now, I, I want to assure you, parents, if you've got kids in high school, they, I don't think they do this anymore. This was the year 2004, the, you know, the dark ages. And things are hopefully a lot better now. But they would play a game called freshman bowling. And they'd line us up at the bottom of the hill as bowling pins. And then they'd take the smallest freshman among us and they would bowl him down the hill toward us and see how many freshmen they could knock over. Now, the worst, though, was our homecoming school assembly. Let me tell you the story. So the whole school is in the gymnasium. It's homecoming. The football team's all recognized. First, the varsity team, and everybody's cheering. Woo! Then JV, everybody's cheering. And then finally the freshmen come in. Everybody's like cheering. Yeah, okay, whatever, freshmen, right? But they're they're cheering. And everyone is cheering us on for this homecoming game. And as the freshman football team left the, the gymnasium, we were told to go back into the locker rooms. But before we went in the locker rooms, the, the, they handed us our helmets. And we're like, what? So we, we put our helmets on. And we open the locker room door and there's all the older kids that are lined up in this tunnel. And and there's this line. we got to go through this line. And they're holding 10 and 25 pound weights. And we had to run through this line as they bash us on the head with our helmets on with these weights. Worst year of my life. Worst year of my life. I, I hated it, but I didn't quit. What kept me going through that year? It's a great question that my therapist and I are still working on. Uh, But today we're starting a new series about hope. But this is really also about pain and suffering. Because here's the reality. Pain and suffering are just a part of life. From the day that you're born to the day you die, you are subject to pain. And it could be physical pain. It could be emotional pain. It could be relational pain. But the reality of life is that pain and suffering are inevitable. If you know the movie, The Princess Bride, as the dread pirate Robert says, he says, life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling you something. And that pain can be as simple as flunking a test in school. or can be as complex as chemo radiation treatments. It can be as simple as a boyfriend or your girlfriend breaking up with you or as complex as dealing with a trauma. It can be pain that comes from outside of us that's inflicted upon us by some foreign unseen virus that just spreads across nations. Hey, pandemic, remember that? Or it can be pain that is self-inflicted because of the decisions that we made and now we're suffering the consequences of that decision. The question for us today is how do you cope with your pain? We call this coping mechanisms. We all have them. Maybe it's sports, whether playing sports or watching sports or The thought of your next achievement at work, you just think about work and that's your coping mechanism or some accomplishment you can have in school, getting straight A's or the next Amazon box that comes in the mail. That's a coping mechanism or the next family vacation that you're going to take or the next weekend, the next party, the next event. Maybe it's your spouse or or fiance, girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever that is, who that, that helps you cope with your pain knowing that at the end of a hard day, you can come home to that person or they're there and you can, you know, that, that, that they're there in the end. Or you cope with the loneliness that you experience 
with the hope of knowing that there's somebody out there for you. Maybe you cope through your kids. Or maybe your relationship with your kids is a little bit codependent. Um, you know, all of these are pretty good coping mechanisms. They're not bad. They're not evil. But there are also the bad ones. You know, coping mechanism could be your next drink, your next hit. Next time you can get alone with your phone to watch pornography. You know, what coping mechanisms get you through the pain of this life? And here's the reality. What you cope with is what you ultimately are hoping in. What you cope with is what you hope in. We all need hope. And what we use to cope becomes our hope. Because when life feels hopeless, we need something to turn our attention to that's going to carry us through that pain. But here's the thing. You and I, we need a better hope than the things that we put our hope in. We need a better hope than the New England Patriots. They're going to let us down as they already have. We need a better hope than the next vacation. We need a better hope because suffering, it's inevitable. Life is pain. It's not a matter of if you're going to experience it. It's a matter of when. And the world around us, I don't know if you've felt this, it feels like it's falling apart more and more. Tensions between Israel and Palestine, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, the, the, you know, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, it's a big word, 2023 has been the worst year on record for billion dollar disasters in the U.S. alone. This has been the worst year for natural disasters in the U.S., not to mention all the disasters that have happened in other parts of our world. We need a better hope because suffering is inevitable in this life and suffering will ultimately test the hope that you have. I want to tell you about a man named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, he was a Jewish psychiatrist who endured the suffering of the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And within months of being uh, liberated from these camps, he sat down to write a book titled Man's Search for Meaning. And it went on to sell, you know, almost tw over 12 million copies. The book is a recounting of this man's experience being in a concentration camp for three years of his life. And because he was a psychiatrist, it wasn't just about him. He took note of how others around him were responding during the suffering of those camps. And he said that there was kind of four different types of people. One, one, one subset of individuals became brutal. They just became like downright angry and nasty people. And they were the nicest of people when they went in. But when put through the trials of the Holocaust, they became these brutal and mean-spirited individuals. There's another group that they simply gave up because they lost all hope. They refused to get up refused to get dressed. The threats from the guards did nothing to, to get them out of that state. They simply gave up. It's actually a story of a man that he uh, was friends with in the camp that uh, he had a dream in February 1945 that his liberation would come one month later on March 30th. He had this dream, this man, and, and this dream gave him hope and something to live for, something to, to, to get him through the suffering. But as the date got closer to March 30th, the war got worse and worse. And that dream seemed more and more unlikely. So on March 30th, the day that this man had previously dreamed of his freedom, he got sick. He died a day later. Hope. Hope. We all need hope. So that's the second group of people that they just gave up. He said, still there were others who held on saying, if I could just survive, I can get all my hopes back. Whatever's waiting for me on the other side of this fence, whether it's someone or something, there was something waiting on the other side. And it could have been the, the hope of their health getting better again, the, their family waiting for them, the professional achievements coming back to them, the fortune, their position in society, whatever it is, it would all be restored to them. Their previous hopes would come back. But here's the thing, even after they were freed, many of them still went into a deep depression and went on to commit suicide. Because as Frankel writes, he said, there could be no earthly happiness which could compensate for all we had suffered. The pain and suffering that they experienced stuck with them and misplaced hope could not help them cope with it. No earthly happiness could account for everything they experienced. But Frankel observed that there were a few who, as he quoted, kept their full inner liberty. They had a hope that sustained them through it all. 
That though they were suffering, though they were hurting, though they were walking through painful trials, they were still full of hope. They still had peace. Franco went on to say in his book, he said, Life in the concentration camp tore open the human soul and exposed its depths. See, suffering has a way of exposing the depths of what we hope in. When someone receives a cancer diagnosis or loses a loved one or experiences physical, emotional, or psychological trauma, it has this way of exposing the depths of what that person was truly hoping in. You know, it's how two people can walk through the same exact suffering and respond to it in two completely different ways. Some would give up and some would continue to believe. Do you have a hope that suffering and death cannot destroy? Do you have a hope that can sustain you through suffering and death? If your ultimate hope is anything that's finite, anything that's in this world that's material, then suffering is simply the stripping away of those things. And let me say, if you can't handle suffering, then you can't handle life because eventually everything finite will be taken from us. In the end, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but here's the thing. Our spouses will be taken from us. Our health will be taken from us. Our possessions will be taken from us. The the children that we raise up will one day grow up and leave our home. Everything will one day leave us. And so you and I need an infinite hope, an eternal hope, a living hope. Because as Christians, the hope that is offered to us is so much more than just mere optimism that says, hopefully things will work out in the end. No, the hope that we have, the hope that we have gives us an assurance through the heartaches and through the hardships of this life. Therefore, we can hope fully through every trial and test of our faith. So how do you get that hope? That's what this series is all about. We're in this series called Hopefully. Finding and living in that living hope that can sustain us through any and every circumstance in this life. And what we're going to discover today is that the hope that you and I need is found in three ways. The hope, the living hope, looks back to something. It looks forward to something. And it looks into something. And we're going to see all three today in this passage we're going to read. And all three are necessary if we're going to have a hope that sustains us through the suffering of this life. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at a book of the Bible called 1 Peter. And today we'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And we're in the NIV version. Uh, This is found in the New Testament portion of our Bibles, which is towards the end of our Bibles. It's a letter written by a man named Peter. You guessed it. And Peter was one of Jesus' disciples who, uh, after Jesus ascended to heaven, Peter went on to become one of the apostles who started the Christian church. The group of people who gathered to worship and gathered to, to, to worship and then they scattered to spread the good news of Jesus to the world around them. And Peter writes this letter that we're going to read between the years 62 and 63 AD, sometime in there. Now to give you some context In that year, what's happening, this is about the same time that James, the brother of Jesus and the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was murdered. As well, what's happening is the Apostle Paul is put in prison at this point. And the man who sits on the throne of Rome is a man by the name of Nero. And we're going to talk more about Nero next week and what kind of ruler he was. But I'm just going to sum it up to say he was not a good dude. (laughs) He murdered Christians just for looking at him the wrong way. And it was this scary environment that caused a lot of Christians to scatter. And where did they go? Well, Peter tells us in the very first verse of his letter. He writes this. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So Peter is writing this letter as an apostle of Jesus Christ and his audience are these Christians who have scattered and he he says that they are exiles. They've left their homes, they've left everything that they've known and they're in this foreign place. And for those of you who are visual learners, here's a a map of kind of what this looks like. All right, so um, Peter's writing from Rome in Italy And he's writing to these Christians who have scattered throughout Asia Minor. So you can see um, kind of over this way, you see these 
these areas right over here is where these Christians have migrated to. And they're in these places that are still under Roman rule and oppression. Today it's modern day Turkey, but it's still under Roman rule at the time of this writing. The threat is still there. And Peter's going to write to encourage these Christians and remind them of how they can get and keep a living hope that's going to sustain them through any and every trial. He goes on in verse 3 to say this. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, Praise be to the Father. And praise be to Jesus Christ, the Son, because of what? It says, because in God's great mercy, in great mercy, when you and I deserved death, we instead received a new birth. And this new birth is this idea of baptism. Over the next um, few weeks, we're going to be celebrating new birth through baptisms. And this new birth is something that we are baptized into. And it says that, It says that we're baptized into a living hope. That this living hope, this is a hope that sustains. Peter just comes right out and says how we can get this hope that's eternal. It's by looking back to something. To what? To the resurrection. The resurrection is where our hope lies. Now you might be asking, how could an event that happened 2,000 years ago give me hope today? Right? What's the relevancy of something that happened 2,000 years ago? Well, you, you might even be asking the question, did this even happen? Like, I don't even know if I really believe that the resurrection happened, Pastor Matt. I don't know if I agree with that. And you might not believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And we're glad that you're watching today. You know, but, but maybe you believe he's just a good teacher. That Jesus was a good teacher and you just can't make amends with the fairy tale part of Christianity. And there are some Christian traditions and streams that would say, you know, it doesn't matter if the resurrection happened or not. You, you, you just, just be a good person, you know, just love people. And you can have hope in the idea of the resurrection, but, you know, it, it, whether it happened or not, not a big deal. But the end of that way of thinking is, well, hopefully things work out. Hopefully Jesus rose from the dead, but even if he didn't, you know, it's all good. But it's, that's not what Peter's saying. He's, he's writing to these Christians. Now remember, Peter, who was an eyewitness of Jesus Christ himself. He walked with him for three years of his life. Peter, who saw Jesus crucified on the cross and then saw him days later. Peter, who in the face of persecution, continued to declare that his Messiah rose from the dead. See, if the resurrection was made up, why would Peter give his life to die for a lie? He had nothing to gain and everything to lose unless the resurrection was true. And here he says that you can have a living hope. You can have a hope that sustains you through thick and thin. A hope that endures. And this hope is in the resurrection. Now the purpose of the sermon isn't to get into it like this historical justification of the resurrection. That deserves a sermon all on its own and one day we will do that. But the purpose is to show that our living hope, it looks back to something. It looks back to the resurrection. This singular event is central to our hope because we have that resurrection power within us. And that's what gives us hope. But we also look forward to something. Peter writes that this new birth is also, it's it's into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. See, those who were formerly Jewish, they would have understood this word inheritance as a land that God had promised to the Israelites and everything that came with that land. You might have heard it. It's called the promised land, the land of Canaan. But even in the Old Testament, this inheritance, this, this land was subject to perish, to spoil, to fade, to decay. And the things in this world that you and I, we put our hope in, are eventually going to be taken from us. They eventually will perish, spoil, or fade. As we said, we lose it all in the end. But Peter is writing about something that we could never lose. Something that is untouchable. Something that's unchanging. Something that's imperishable. There's nothing 
that anyone can do to ruin this inheritance for you. Not even you can ruin it. Not even you can screw it up. No matter how much you mess up, no matter what you do, you can't ruin this. It's kept in heaven for you. See, a living hope looks back. It looks back to the resurrection and it also looks forward to the reward, to the inheritance that's waiting for us. And we're going to learn more about this inheritance as we continue through this, this, this chapter. And Peter goes on, he says this, he says that, it, that we who through faith were shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. It might feel like we're living in the last time right now, but we're being shielded in these days. This living hope shields us. It shields you. It protects you. It guards you. And if your hope is in something eternal, then you're protected. Through this living hope, you're safe. You might say, how am I safe? I'm suffering. Matt, you don't know what I'm walking through right now. I'm walking through hell on earth right now. How am I safe? Yeah, you're suffering but you're safe. How can that be? Though outwardly, as Paul writes, he says, though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. See, you could suffer and you could still be safe because there's something that suffering can never take from you. And Peter goes on to say what that is. He says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you might have, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I want you to hear this, that both of these emotions are present tense, right? He, he doesn't say that, you know, that, that you were rejoicing, but now you're suffering. And it doesn't say you were suffering, but now you're rejoicing. It says you are rejoicing greatly and you are suffering grief. Yes, you are suffering, but you're still rejoicing. How can we be doing that at the same time? See, most Christians, we don't know how to do this well. We see someone suffering grief and we try to minimize their pain to comfort them, to say, well, well, stop, you know, stop, just stop crying. They're in a better place. You should be happy. But here's the thing that having joy doesn't mean you can't also suffer grief. Think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, moments before he's, he's arrested and, and then crucified. He suffered grief so hard, so greatly that he sweat drops of blood on the ground and he prayed father if there's any other way if there's any other way that this can go down God please take this cup from me he's saying I don't want to suffer I mean Jesus is suffering grief in many trials in that moment and then Jesus walked out of the garden and doo -doo, you know whistled his way up to the cross I got the joy joy, joy. no it doesn't say that that Jesus grieved and yet he still had joy in the midst of it. See, both emotions can happen simultaneously. And he, Peter goes on, he says, these have come. These have come. He's saying these trials have come. These experiences, this suffering has come to you so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold is anything more worthy of gold, is anything of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Let's break this down. So Peter says that the trials of this life that cause us to suffer, they've come into our lives for one purpose, to sharpen us, to refine our faith. And Peter compares our faith to gold. You know, and, and there's nothing more desirable than gold, right? But gold is the greatest of all materials in this world, but do you know what happens to gold when you put it in a fire? It says here it's refined by fire. The hotter, I want to tell you about gold. The hotter gold gets, if it's pure gold, it gets brighter. But if you put fake gold in fire, it actually gets darker. So that's how people can test whether something's real gold or fake gold. Gold will never burn up, but it will get brighter if it's pure and darker if it's not pure. When you and I are in the fiery furnace of trials in this life, the purity of our faith shines brighter and brighter. That's how people can look at someone who's suffering and say, how are you so joyful? You're suffering grief. You're, 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 you're suffering. How are you still full of hope? How? 
And all of this results in, what does he say? All of this results in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Uh, honor, praise, glory, and honor of who? Well, well, we'd say, well, Jesus, right? But here's the thing, that every commentary I read notes that the praise, glory, and honor is not of Jesus, it's from Jesus. And it's actually for us. One day, Jesus is going to look at us and he's going to praise us, glorify us, and honor us. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You endured to the end. He's going to glorify us and praise us because our faith remained genuine through the fire. Our living hope remained steadfast. This is part of that inheritance that we're talking about that we can look forward to one day to hear the words of our Savior speaking truth over us. We need a living hope that looks back to the resurrection, that looks forward to the reward, but also one that looks into something. Peter goes on, he says, concerning this salvation, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care. The prophets of the Old Testament, they were eager and they searched intently to, to, to discover what? It says in the next verse, trying to find out. They're trying to find out the time, when, and the circumstances, how, to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing. How and when is this all going to happen? The, the Old Testament prophets with the Spirit of Christ in them are pointing forward to a future salvation that's going to come. But when and how would that come? This is what they were desperate to know. It says, when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. See, in Jewish belief, it was unbelievable and unthinkable that a Messiah would suffer. That the Messiah would suffer. The Messiah was supposed to be glorified. He was supposed to receive glory and, and, and not to, to suffer. But the prophets filled with the spirit of Christ prophesied about a future Messiah who would endure suffering. And many who were alive at that time, the, the time Jesus was alive, they missed it because they couldn't fathom that this Messiah would be one to suffer. And the prophets, they looked forward to it and they were search, searching and trying to discover who was this person, when was this going to happen? But you and I, we get to look back to it. I mean, what a place in history that we are. We, have, we can look back to this event that we're not searching to try to find out when that was going to happen. The salvation has already come. In verse 12, it says this. It says, it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but they were serving you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then the last thing says this. It says, even angels long to look into these things. What are these things? These things are the gospel. The angels long to look into the gospel. As I said, we need a living hope that looks into something. The gospel. Oh, you mean that good news that Jesus died and rose for my sin? Yeah, that's important. But, but I, I, you know, that's like elementary. I don't need that milk anymore. I, I've, I've moved on to the more meaty, weighty matters. I, I, I got to move on to deeper things. Listen to me. Listen to me. If there's anyone who should be bored of the gospel by now, it's the angels. I mean, they've been around for hundreds of thousands of millions of years, and yet they never tire of the gospel. They never stop caring about the gospel. In fact, the word that they use here for, for long is this word. It, it's the Greek word that also means lust. It's this intense desire that the angels have for the gospel, to look into the gospel. They're looking down upon us and rejoicing every time someone is saved by the gospel. Next Sunday, they're going to be looking down from heaven at each baptism, throwing a party in heaven for every single person who makes a decision to go public with their faith. And they're looking down upon us, rejoicing every time someone is moved again by the gospel. 
You may have already believed in the gospel. You may have already been changed by the gospel. But is the gospel still something you're looking into every single day? Why is this such a big deal to the angels? Because the gospel is about Jesus' living hope. The gospel is about Jesus' living hope. And what was his living hope? Hebrews 12 says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What was his joy? What was Jesus' hope? Who, who was his living hope? What was his living hope? Well, you say, well, it must be heaven. You know, the inheritance waiting for him, the glorious crown for all of his suffering, you know, to hear the praise of the father speaking over his son. Well done. But he already had heaven and he left it. I mean, what compelled Jesus to leave heaven to come down to earth and suffer death on a cross? We know from Isaiah 53, one of those prophets who was searching intently to discover the time when this would happen. Isaiah 53 says, when he, Jesus, sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, by his suffering, he'll be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. You are Jesus' living hope. You're his living hope. I mean, that's the only thing that he didn't have in heaven that he had to come to this earth for. He suffered and he died, but he did it with the hope of knowing that he could have you. I mean, does that move you? It clearly moves me. I'm a crier, but does that move you? Does that stir something within you? Knowing that you are Jesus's living hope will make him your living hope. See, when you fully understand what he did for you, the lengths he went to, not to get some material crown or wealth or even to get praise from his father, but to bring you into a right relationship, to have you for eternity. That is, is what will supply your ultimate living hope. And that is what will sustain you through whatever suffering you might face, knowing that, you're, 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 that Jesus suffered for you. And that's the hope that no one can take from you. Living hope looks back to the resurrection. It looks forward to the reward. And it looks into the gospel. This is the gospel. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God so loved the world that he surrendered his son to suffer. And the son willingly surrendered his life through suffering. Knowing that those who would believe would be with him in eternity. You are his inheritance. You are his prize. You are his living hope. And knowing that you're his living hope will make him your living hope. Now, if you've not been born again into this living hope, today could be your day to start a new life, a new journey with Jesus and make him your Lord, your savior, your living hope. And today could be a day that the angels throw a party in heaven as they celebrate the resurrection power that's coming alive in you. And all it takes is a simple prayer. I'm gonna lead you through that prayer right now. So wherever you are, I invite you to pray this either out loud or in your heart. Just say this, say, Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I need your mercy. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. I turn from my old life and I receive a new birth into a living hope through your resurrection power. You are my Lord. You are my savior. You are my living hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, or if you're rededicating your life to Jesus, we wanna celebrate that decision with you and with the angels. So type in the comments right now, just, just type, Jesus is my living hope. If this is the first time you're doing it, or if you're rededicating your life, say, Jesus is my living hope. 
And then, uh, you know, I, wanna, I want you to fill out a digital connect card. There's a box that says, I committed my life to Jesus today. So there might be a QR code that comes up on the screen right now. You can scan that and it'll take you to a connect card. And just check that box to say, I committed my life to Jesus today. We want to follow up with you and help you in your journey with Jesus. For some of you, maybe the gospel is, has lost its wonder for you. And here's what I want us to do this week. We need to declare truth over our lives. These are just some truth statements that I pulled out of this passage that we just read. It, it, take a screenshot if you need to and declare these over your life every day this week. Say, I'm born again into a living hope. I have resurrection power within me. I have an inheritance that is safe and secure. This living hope is my shield. I can grieve and still believe. My faith is being refined through the fire. I was on Jesus' mind while he suffered. Jesus is my living hope because I was his living hope. See, when you realize that you were the thought that sustained him through his suffering, it makes you, it moves you to make him your living hope. Nothing and no one else can take his place. He is the living hope that can carry us through our pain, through our suffering. Thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross for us. And thank you that you did not just stay dead, but you rose from the dead and you rose from the grave. And because of that, we can have living hope that we're born into. We thank you, Jesus. Give us this hope this week. We pray this in your name. Amen.